Hey everyone and welcome to my Pro Dungeoneering Guide. This is to help anyone out there who knows the basics or a few tips and would like to become better at Dungeoneering themselves. Here we got the summary of it. You got lingo, we got pathing and gating, which consists of pass sizes, GGS movement, smart gating, crit, map tendencies. You got bosses, which has tips, you know, like on Blink. You have efficient DPS, which includes binds, action bar, the ring of kingship. And then you also got pro tips. And if you know the lingo already, I suggest skipping the pathing slash gating. I'd like to give huge credit to GGS, Dungeon Sweepers, and Reddit themselves for being such a great community and getting this video out there for others. Starting off on lingo here, which is acronyms, you have the key colors, which geo for gold, green, you know, orange, blue, silver, crimson, yellow, purple, and then you got the shapes of keys, corner, crescent, diamond, pentagon, triangle, rectangle, shield, wedge. So you need to be able to distinguish between them quickly. For example, B tri, which equals blue triangle, or Goko, which equals gold corner. And then you also have floor types. So there's F equals floor, O slash occult equals cults. You got warped, you got high wars, which is floor 57 to 60. You have number and row, which is the number of floors in a row that a person wants to do. For example, like two row means they want to do two floors in a row. You got rush number to number, which is rush number of floors, i.e. rush 130 means rushing floors 1 through 30 on complexity 1. And then you have important abbreviations here that most people use. You have GD, which is guard door, GT slash GGS, which is group telly or group gate stone. You have G slash gate, which is gate this. You have GTGD, which is gate, telly, and clear the guardian door. You have CGT, which is carry the gate stone. DGT, drop the gate stone. MGT, move the gate stone. SGT, sell the gate stone. It's the same thing as drop, just move it to a path you're on. BGT is buying the gate stone, which you need to drop it. And then MGTB is move the gate stone to the boss. You have fork, which is gate telly if open and explore the other path because the GGS character can't go on that path. You have GTE, which is GT to end. You have FG, which means they have a free gate. And then you have NFG, which means no free gate. You have DE, which means dead end. You have Dwank, which means dead end with key. You have Dank, which means dead end no key. There's also Crit, which is critical path, which is for the boss. And then there's bonus rooms uh, for the rest of the map. There's also different room types. So you got Merc, which is the mercenary leader room. You have Lever slash Labs, which is the lever room. And then you have Emo slash Emo, which is the Emo room. And that's only to name a few. And then you got plus one, plus two, all the way up to plus four, which is me, which just basically means you need one to two or four more players to clear the room. Usually that's used with uh, emotes and levers. So here's some practice for you guys. You got GTGD, MTG, GT Lev, and Emo plus one. You can go ahead and pause the video, or I'm just gonna show the answers right now. So there's the answer on the screen. GTGG, which means Group Telly, clear the guardian door. The second one is move group gate stone to your path. You have three, which is group telly for lover's room. And then you have four, which is an emote room. And then gate your path and then telly instantly. All right, so on to pathing slash gating. Some general info you need to know is you need to know your gates. You need to write it down if necessary. And then you need to know others' gates. It's important that you know both yours and theirs. Everyone should be pathing to be efficient, and don't ignore guard doors. Just split up to open as much doors as possible in a short amount of time. You also need to know your map. Getting in the map here, this is your vital tool to help you organize your team and knowing where to go next. The map cannot circle, and a path can fork, but will never connect. Again. So the icons are players. You got the red as the first, the blue as the second, green third, yellow fourth, gray fifth of whoever joined the party in descending order. So what's so important about the map? This allows the gate telly holder to take the GGS in the direction that looks like it'll have the most doors. The GT needs to be near lots of doors, allowing others to clean up the remaining pass. Prioritizing big portions of the map, allowing you to branch out sooner. There's also less backtracking, which means smaller paths and rooms are likely to dead end. So identifying path sizes. There's three things you need to remember for determining path size. One is how many doors are branching from this room and how many possible doors from the next rooms. Two is the total size of the area for the path to expand into. And three is how other paths may interfere. 
In this example, you can see purple can branch into three directions, blue can branch into three, and green can branch into two. The paths are likely to go straight, so purple and blue are the best bet. Purple has the more potential, though, because it has four spaces north of the home telly. The entire west portion of the map needs to exist, so it'll go west soon. Green is at the edge of the map, so both doors are less likely to exist because blue and purple can spawn where the green goes. So where should the GGS be taken? Obviously the purple path because it has the most potential. You can see in this example that the white room can only branch one door initially, but since the northeast area can branch only from that room, it'll be a pretty decent sized path. The map doesn't create 10 blank spaces next to each other for no reason. Here you can see yellow and red are competing with each other, while green will certainly have a large path. This doesn't mean take the GGS there, but rather keep in mind the map and how it'll progress. So carrying the GT in the GGS movement. The GT redistributes players across the map. Good teamwork requires paying attention to your team and always making the best use of yourself by completing paths or assisting teammates. Good communication is how this is achieved. The GT holder should always pay attention to the next biggest path. The GT should be carried ahead of the team so that people can clean up rooms behind it and have something to do when they gate telly. The gate telly is a teleport too. It can cover doors for quite some time and especially guard doors. Often someone will have a free gate before the gate telly gets too far or has to be moved, but if this ever happens, the person with the least important gate should break if necessary. In this example, you can see green and gray have decent sized paths, so if either gray or green start to having to spread out their gate, they should move the gate stone. Smart gating. Now, is your gate in the right spot? As you can see in this example, green is at a guard door and also has the room to west gated. They should move the gate stone to the guard door and regate the room to west. Having the team run two rooms is way worse than one person running two rooms to regate, obviously. You always want to gate the one with a bigger path, even if both doors were key doors. Dwanks tend to give keys that are large paths first, and it saves time moving the gate telly into the bigger area even if you have to do the dead end first. It's important to always regate an area, and as you complete your path, check if other doors nearby need gating. It's your responsibility to know all doors in your area and get them completed. Backing up gates. So when a path looks large, it's better to have multiple people gate it until they have something better to gate. In this example, you can see two players gated one on one mine because it's fairly large, and multiple people gated yellow wedge too. Doubling gates is important for paths that look like they need more than one person to complete. Now over gating. There may be times where you're exploring a path but run into a door you can't do and have no free gate. Based on other players gates, it may be better to break your old gate and gate a new area. Knowing when to break your gate is very important in hard maps with many, many doors. To avoid breaking gates, if yours are full, then do not explore paths when others without a gate can. Stick to the guard doors and really small paths. You can always say gate telly free gate if you're incompetent at keeping track of others. So pathing. Pathing is all about prioritization. You must have looked at your map so you can open larger paths while holding the GGS and open smaller paths if you're alone. In this picture you can see thou shall prioritize large while in possession of the GGS. While, if you're alone, you should prioritize small. In the earlier map, GGS holders should gate each fork as they carry gate stone to cover rooms if necessary or click the MGT to biggest path when the key is found. During the mid-map, whoever has a path on the map gated should carry the gate stone to MGT if necessary. In the late map, the gate telly acts as a helper for small paths that weren't finished. Now crit. So crit consists of 19 to 23 rooms. The skill requirement doors will range from 9 levels under the highest level on the team. So if everyone's maxed, or if just one person is maxed, it could vary between 90 to 99. The formula for the XP gain from a skill requirement is level times 5 plus 10. Crit doors with max are always 460 to 505 XP gained. Anyone with XP share on will not give you regular XP from doors. This is why the famous concept of turning your XP share off is around. Note, bonus rooms can also have a 90 plus requirement. So less than 460 XP gained is bonus, but 460 plus is not necessarily crit. Early map, the gate telly should be on the crit path. As the map progresses though, the GT shouldn't stick to the crit. Because, you know, there's always more bonus rooms than crit. 
Having the GT sit at the dead end crate is silly and the gate telly is used to redistribute players. It's better to have it at the biggest area in general. Crit generally branches the most but is not necessarily that big. So map tendencies. Map gaps. So the map doesn't like to fill in the gaps of other paths and it's likely that the white circles will be blank spaces on the map as you can see in the example. Random dead ends. So they're called random for a reason, and they aren't that likely to happen. But it looks like the red square might dead end because all the other facing east doors have. On to bosses. As you can see in the meme, I'll have you know that I got Blink as a dungeoneering boss twice, and I only died eight times combined. Well, fear not. Blink is actually really, really easy. In these four simple steps, he can be easily defeated. Step one is... He only runs north and east, so you want to stand in the northeast corner. Step two is he appears on the minimap before he runs, so you can obviously spot when he's going to go to his next pillar. You always want to protect range, not mage. Even though the hit splat is mage, protecting range actually has to damage while protecting mage does nothing. Protect from mage only has to damage when he does his kapow special, but it's still better to protect range because he still does more damage running. And last but not least, when he says, here it comes, raise the pillar to block his one-hit attack and stand behind it. Or you could tell he out, it really depends. So the Warp Galuga, he's super easy. He has a special where the Galuga smashes its arm directly into the ground, causing four tentacles to close in on the player it is facing and bring the player to one life point. All you gotta do is simply move one square to negate this attack. The Dreadnought is also super easy. Just be cautious of the orange blobs that may spawn on the ground and cause severe damage as well as prayer drain. You always want to protect melee from this boss. And last but not least, the Bulwark Beast. Just mage him to break his armor, otherwise if you have no switch, then kick him, because it's better than melee or ranged weapon. The rest of the bosses are pretty self-explanatory and don't require that much information or tips in order to defeat them effectively. Do note though, Calgar is generally not worth doing because he takes forever to kill. So efficient DPS. This is assuming you have optimal biomes and max combat stats. The general principles remain the same, but use common sense and adjust accordingly depending on your own personal levels and binds. Those with unbalanced combat stats should prioritize in guard doors by concentrating on monsters that are weak to the player's strongest combat style. Range is the best DPS because of the elite task set for dungeoneering. Max level forgotten warriors and guard dogs should never be ranged. Use mage on them or melee instead. Depends on which one you're hybriding with. All other monsters should be ranged. With the introduction of the dungeon elite task, you're able to use sniper and desperado rings at the same time which offer insane accuracy and damage. This provides you with plus 20% in both ranged and damage accuracy. Melee and mage rings also boost accuracy, but not damage. Here's the ring of kinship. With the elite task done. This is what it should look like. You should have Desperado as your secondary, Sniper as your primary, and in the magic one you should have Blitzer as your quick switch. If you don't have elite task done, don't worry, just switch Desperado and Sniper with primary and secondary. So action bars. These are personal preference, but they shouldn't deviate from the ones shown. If you choose numbers as hotkeys, don't put teleports for 1 through 5, as puzzles sometimes use those, and you don't want to have an accidental gate telly. So here's what the range action bar should look like. Here's the abilities and orders. You got piercing shot, fragmentation shot, snipe, dazing shot, ricochet, snapshot, rapid fire, and then you have all the gate tellies and different ones. Here's the binds. So bind one should be your highest tier short bow available. If you're on legacy, it should be the hex, but if you're on EOC, it should be Sagittarian. Bind 2, Defensive Bind, either the highest tier range body available or the Shadow Silk Hood. The Shadow Silk Hood is worse though due to an accuracy debuff. Bind 3 should be a secondary weapon. Generally staff is preferred, however, if your melee stats are significantly higher than your magic, the highest two-handed melee weapon available is best. Your Bind 4 should consist of a Blood Necklace, but it could also consist of a second Defensive Bind if you haven't gotten the Blood Necklace set. And by the time you're 120 Dungeoneering Bind 5, you should have a Blood Necklace, so it should be your second defensive bind. Your ammo should consist of the highest tiers available, which is Primal, obviously, and then the Potion should either be Strong Artisan, Gatherer, Naturalist, or Survival. The order for the most commonly used potions is Artisan, Gatherer, Natural, Survivor, and Descending Orders. 
So some pro tips, when to skip remaining rooms, when it requires a boost and it's one of the last few rooms and the boss is killed, or when the dungeon is too long, i.e. the dungeon is greater than 12 minutes. Dungeoneering medium tasks. Now if you can't do elites or hard, you should definitely do the mediums. This will allow you to claim your reward from Smuggler for 40 laws and cosmics per dungeon, which is really great. Changing starter items. So this just recently came out, so you can talk to the smuggler and choose the fifth option. As you can see, the fifth option is, can you change my starting items? He'll prompt you with, I'll automatically take your coins and provide a selection of feathers, rune essence, and antipoison in return. This is great for puzzles like the ferret room. Now the portal puzzle. The portal puzzle has always one of the starting portals lead to the panels by going opposite to every portal you come out of. In groups, it's called N-Ops, South Ops, etc. N just means north and S means south. Another thing is you always want to look for keys before entering room, especially puzzle rooms. I cannot stress this enough. So in this example of me doing Dungeoneering, I'll be showing you where you should be looking every time you open a door. So as you can see, this is where you should be looking every time it zooms in here. Immediately after the door is open, you should look on your minimap for a red dot and run towards it. Again, you'll see I just glance at my mini map and see there is no red dot, so I move on. One last time, when I open this door, I direct my attention to the mini map, see there is a red dot, and then run towards it to pick it up. This may be self explanatory, but sometimes people just don't pay attention. Now, you don't need to clear a lever's room as long as everyone tallies to the room. It's also possible to do levers with only four people, with one person running between two levers closest together. In this picture, you can see it's the top left. Now, there's no need to do the whole maze room, unless there's a key in the middle. All you gotta do is just open the doors that are there. Another pro tip is you want to have potions in your notes. You're welcome to copy mine if you want. As you can see, it just says Dungeoneering, and then it says Gather, Nat, Art, Survival, with the supplies you need and the skills. Now, the perfect Juju Dungeoneering potion. It's made using Zamorak's Favor 3 and Harmony Moss, which requires 91 Herblore. It can be drank at any level, though, and be bought off the GE. This gives 5% damage boost in Dungeoneering and a hidden 2 level boost to all skills for opening skill doors. This is really great for Dungeoneering and I'd highly suggest using it. Alright guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. You can check out my previous video or random video below, and don't forget to spread this around to make others in the Dungeoneering community efficient.